Firstly, the answer, the drug facts label. This label lists the medicine's active ingredients and purpose, how much to take, and warnings you should know before using it. Remember, even OTC medicines you buy without a prescription can cause side effects you don't want. So follow the information listed on the drug facts label. For more information, visit FDA.gov slash drug facts label. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Long ago, you wouldn't think of galloping on a horse while doing calligraphy. And you wouldn't have attempted to ride your bike while typing a letter. Yet you think you can safely operate a multi-ton vehicle while texting? Behind the wheel is no place to multitask. If you want to BRB, drive now and text later. Lives depend on it. Visit StopTextStopRex.org. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. A hundred years ago, there were a hundred thousand tigers in the wild. Today, there are as few as 3,200. The Earth's wild animals can't speak up when they need help, but we can. Be the voice for those who have no voice. Visit worldwildlife.org. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas for Habitat for Humanity Restore. Habitat Restores are nonprofit home improvement stores and donation centers that sell new and gently used furniture, building materials, and appliances to the public at a fraction of the retail cost. The Ulster County Restore at 406 Route 28 in Kingston needs your donations. Call our hotline at 845-853-7499 to schedule your free pickup. And thanks. Hi, I'm Ruth Quick um, from Town of Ulster. I support Kingston Community Radio, and you should too. This portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Visit their newest branch, conveniently located at the Ulster Commons Plaza in Lake Katrine. Experience the difference that local community banking offers with the convenience of another great location. Easy access, plenty of parking, and a 24-hour ATM. Ulster Savings Bank. Invested in community. Invested in you. Member FDIC. <laughs> okay, Merry Christmas, Hugh. Merry Christmas, Mario. Yeah, you too, uh, Lawrence. Lawrence. Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas to everybody to who's The out. Maxwell family, Merry Christmas to the listeners, anybody wise enough to get up 6 o'clock, 7 <laughs> o'clock in the morning to listen to our, our show. Um, we're here. This is the end of the year for us. This our is phone our, number is. This, is. this is it, and... We're going to make this about our, and we do have a guest at 8, but um, we're going to make this hopefully about our listeners. Our phone number here is 331-9255, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to exchange Christmas greetings with you. Um, and um, so we're going to start off the, uh, we're going to start off today's show with, um, an annual tradition. Yeah. How many years now, you have you been writing your Christmas wish list? You know, Mario, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think it's I'm I'm going to call it thirty, which would cover the uh, three, four papers that uh, I've worked for, and it was in it was in all of them. Um, it started out as kind of a whim. Um, I'd see people on the street. And I'd think of uh, you know what they did or didn't do during the year, and uh, come up with some kind of a gag gift. And it was it was meant in the it is was and is meant in the spirit of the season, because I get to play the Grinch for the other fifty fifty one weeks of the year, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and pick on these people mercilessly. So around Christmas time, I I try to say something nice about them or something funny, and. Uh, uh, it is the spirit of Christmas. So uh, we were going to do an Abbott and Costello routine this morning. Uh, well, I, I what I what I um, um, what I have found, you know, when I when I read the Christmas list, is um, a lot of this is uh, just inside stuff. Yeah. So I thought maybe what might be nice today is for you to share some of these inside, um, you know, uh, uh, jokes, jokes, <laughs> and, and and you know. With um, with everybody, so uh, we can have a little more fun with this. So, well, let me let me just clarify that my boss used to get on me once in a while because he didn't know any of the jokes. In fact, nobody other than me knows all of them. Yep. 
And um, uh, <laughs> that's uh, the, the – and uh, he, says, no, he says, nobody knows these jokes. I said, no, actually everybody does, everybody on that list. Yep. It's very rare when the person who I refer to uh, doesn't understand, uh, you know, what the ins- inside joke, which is kind of politics anyway, which is an inside joke. Yeah. And for a change, I get to write the inside jokes. Exactly. So I, I want to start with mine. Because <laughs> for me, you gave pennies from heaven. Well, Catalano and I walk every, uh, almost every, I guess five days a week, Mario, yeah, I guess it works yeah, out. Yeah. And uh, we walk for between three and four miles, depending how we're feeling. And we got, we have to, we, we have to, we have, for, by way of full disclosure, Yeah. we walk hard because we're trying to stay one step ahead of guys like Bernie Gray. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so. And, and yeah, and he's right behind <laughs> us these days. Yeah, the undertaker. <laughs> So uh, Catalano has been fortunate to have a very successful dental career, and uh, he has a couple of nice cars and a, and a trophy wife and a nice house. He's got just about everything uh, materially and spiritually, I would say. He's a, he's a happy man for the most part. Um, those of you who don't know him, he's also rather tall. What are you, about 6'3", Mario? Yeah. Yeah. And so when we're walking along, if he spots a penny on the, on the, on the street, he will he will he will stop in his tracks, and then bend over. And the last time he uh, he tried to retrieve this penny, uh, he he kind of lost his balance. And I saved him, of course, because I was standing next to him. And this man will do anything for a, for a penny. And his 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 motto is uh, better in my pocket than on the street. So that's where yeah. pennies from heaven came from. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that, I, that's I, that's a fair that was a fair gift. Thank you. Thank you. So I noticed that you started off with the um, <clears throat> uh, state Supreme Court Judge Kevin Bryant. So I know that you and Kevin have a long history. Mm-hmm. We're very proud of Kevin. Yes, uh, locally, as a community, we're very proud of Kevin. So um, tell us about that one, something in a long black robe. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. I yeah, think. the long black robe, obviously, is uh, the... Um, um, the robes of a Supreme Court justice, uh, which he will don, I think, on Tuesday. Uh, they're they're having a swearing in at the courthouse, and it's sold out, as it were. Uh, it'll be one of the biggest crowds, and I I think when we when we hear crowds these days, we get a little squeamish. But in any case, uh, uh, Kevin and the other two justices, who will forever be known as the other two justices. Uh, will be uh, will be uh, will be formally sworn in at the uh, county courthouse, and then there'll be a uh, uh, a reception at uh, Wiltwick uh, Country Club. Uh, Kevin uh, is uh, the first uh, uh, African American uh, uh, to sit on the uh, third district uh, Supreme Court, which is seven counties, including Ulster and Green and uh, Columbia. And then the capital district, uh, and, and Sullivan, Sullivan. yeah, Sullivan, Sullivan to Harry, yeah, Orange, Albany, no, is Orange, Albany, no, Albany, Albany yeah, 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 and uh, and uh, he had been, um, uh, in fact, I, th- I think he is until the end of the year. Uh, uh, the city of Kingston's um, um, uh, corporation, uh, corporation council, Kingston has in effect two corporation councils, but. In order to have a smoother transition, uh, the, the mayor Mayor Noble agreed to to keep Kevin on. Plus, he could use the paycheck, yeah. <laughs> you know. And um, well, uh, just, I think that's a smart move. Though. It is. Having, it was. You know, having, yeah. a, having, having a seamless passing. Of yeah, the particularly time. particularly something like uh, yeah. uh, the Corporation Council. There's probably do- dozens and dozens of cases that are pending. Well, he's getting sued every other day from uh, you know um, uh, Bender. So they probably got enough, you know, enough work for two. Yeah, and um, Ke- Kevin is a, I think, is a, a quite an inter- interesting American story uh, uh, in that he uh, he grew up at uh, as a child. He was raised at Rondot Gardens, which is not exactly Lux housing, and uh, and some of the issues that uh, that he had to deal with uh, there as a child, as a teenager, and basketball became his uh, his passion. He's a pretty good basketball player. In fact, very good. He was a, he was a county all star. Wow. 
wow. at uh, Kingston High School. Unfortunately, they were lousy teams. He was he was the only star, and they didn't draw a lot of fans. And then he went to uh, he went to college and uh, Albany Law School, practice here in Kingston with uh, Judge uh, Mike Brune Jr. Oh, okay. You know, so they were uh, general practitioners, and then he became a uh, corporation counsel, and uh, he is and will be a uh, a role model for other kids, uh, but particularly African American kids who can look to, could look to this this uh, this very accomplished man now in a high, in fact, the highest judicial office <coughs> in our area, and uh, so congratulations, Kevin, as as Mario said. We're all in our community. Very, very proud of you. Yeah, that was a that was a great one. That was nice to start off with them, um, and then you follow that with um, um, a gift for Dave Donaldson. It says um, your gift to him is postcards from the edge. <laughs> that sounds like a little odd. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's 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 meant in the spirit of of, of Christmas. Uh, Dave, Dave will have a lot of time on his hands now got it he he does spend a fair amount of time at his home in florida okay during the winter time but uh uh he'll be busy at something they donaldson has uh, has been a public official for 35 years uh yeah. about half of his adult life and uh he uh he he lost a couple of elections uh uh, uh this year and is no, and and will retire though as the uh, as the uh, uh, chairman chairman of the county county legislature. Interesting development on that part. Of, I don't know if this is breaking news. It's not absolutely confirmed, but uh, Democrats uh, caucused uh, legislature Democrats caucus to nominate a uh, chair for ah. for the next year. Yeah, and uh, the person I'm told. That that got the <coughs> there's uh, there will be 16 Democrats out of 23 legislators uh, uh, in January. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a redo, as it were. Uh, Tracy uh, Bartles from uh, so they're gonna they're from, gonna uh, Gardner uh, will 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 probably be the uh, chairwoman again. And ironically, uh, Tracy was uh, Bartles was chairperson. Uh, and then along came Dave Donaldson, and and bumped her off, and then uh, he did a couple of terms, and their por their official portraits will hang in the uh, side by side actually, uh, will hang in the legislative chambers for eternity, and of course the joke going around the legislature is you have got uh, you, first as as uh, as you're looking at what they call the the wall of fame, uh, you've got uh, Tracy Bartles. Dave Donaldson, Tracy Bartles. Tracy Bartles. <laughs> so what you have is th is a thorn between two roses. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, I'm using up all my material for the column here. <laughs> I got to save something. Yeah, save save a little. So all right. So that was uh, well. It was nice of you to think of Dave. Um, you know, he's um, about to be uh, Dave who, but you know, Dave Private Citizen. Dave Private Citizen. Okay. So then um, you threw out um, a... You can pick them at random if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, how about uh, Christine Hine? It says, a Christmas Eve visit from the governor. Well, that goes back so a Christine couple... Christine said she's at People's Place. People's Place, uh, which is, uh, Christine, in my long experience uh, of covering uh, nonprofits and everything else in between... Christine Hine is, without a doubt, the, the most uh, efficient public relations person I've ever seen. Hardly a week goes by when there isn't some some noteworthy, and it's noteworthy. They yeah. do a lot of. People's Place does a lot of good work. I'm a I'm a I'm a volunteer there on and there. I'm for, a donor, and you're a donor, and, and, and give them a lot of stuff. Yeah, and every, uh, I work in their food food delivery area, uh, <clears throat> um, but uh, the governor came to town twice, I think, that I know of. 
governor could have slipped into town, and actually she wouldn't have called yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, and this governor's got her. Uh, she's she's on. Uh, she, you know, she's on the church circuit now, I think. Isn't she? Yeah, I mean she's 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 rolling, rocking, and rolling. She is rocking. Got to snuff out any oldest competition in the primary. Well, I think she snuffed out her main competition, uh, a couple of uh, Letitia James. But in any case, she came to Kingston twice that I know of. One yeah. time, one time was. Uh, uh, she was practically ignored by local Democrats who liked Letitia James at the time. They were, yeah, yeah, they, they were genuflecting at the time. Yeah, yeah, but only on one knee. Yeah, one knee, because you never know when the other shoe is going to drop. Oh, the stop other it, stop it, drop. stop. <laughs> but then the other time, uh, she came to town and uh, she visited the Salvation Army. Oh, so she this gave had, out turkeys there. She gave out turkeys, days. yes. And this had to have, uh, you know, the Salvation Army is not that far from People's Place. And uh, uh, People's Place is what's in the paper all the time. And the governor comes to town and doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't come to People's Place, but I thought it was noteworthy. But, you know, um, I understand that uh, governors can, you know, do some things, but um, it apparently People's Place has a direct line to the Ulster County Industrial Development Corporation. <laughs> so <clears throat> they were um they were given a hundred thousand dollars to pass out fifty dollar gift cards to two thousand people. Tell me about all the inconsistencies and potential problems you see with um first of all I'm looking at this from a whole different, you know, all, all different perspectives. The Ulster County Development Corporation is supposed to um, create jobs and not be a charitable organization. It's, so It's not a charitable organization. Well, it is now if you give $100,000 to a charitable cause. I think you become... Well, they're, they're giving away $26 million to the Kingstonian, so you might call that uh, some kind of charity with our money. Uh, listen, I, 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 don't get me started. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so so the, point, the point that I'm trying to make is uh, I, I'm okay to a certain extent with uh, throwing some of that money around. It's not going to create any jobs. That's their main focus. I always like it when organizations maintain a focus and uh, and actually execute on their mission versus trying to all this uh, do good stuff that essentially um, is almost anti-mission. And uh, you know, it's nice, it's pretty, it sounds good, thank you, et cetera, et cetera. But $50 gift cards, they barely, they, they it's, it, I mean, nothing. That, it's going to do almost nothing. And the other part that I, I, I uh, and again, I don't know it, the, the outreach of People's Place, but. It's pretty extensive. If somebody from Ellenville has to drive to Kingston to get a $50 gift card, they spent 20 bucks in gas. How, I mean, think, you know, so. What was this? Just a uh, you know a local deal, and and the rest of the county doesn't count. I I I, I don't um, you know I, I was a little disappointed. And not only that, but uh, there are uh, there are probably forty or fifty really good uh, organizations in town. Good point. Yeah. In, in, in Ulster County, and they got particular. nothing. They got nothing. And they and and they were the recipients of no um, uh, anything. Well, in the spirit of Christmas, why don't we move on? My colleague, uh, my former, uh, we're all colleagues, I guess, uh, us old timers. Paul, Paul Brooks, uh, for instance, uh, uh, is an adjunct uh, professor, I think, at SUNY New Paltz, and he teaches journalism. Wow. Paul, Paul was a really good reporter for the Middletown Record for a long time. And so uh, for him, we give uh, wide awake students, which are, I understand are hard to find these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Stacy Ryan, uh, the uh, director of Ulster County United Way, <coughs> excuse me, is retiring in June after some 30 odd years uh, as head of that agency. And uh, like People's Place, uh, uh, 
United Way does a lot of good work and helps a lot of people. Yep. And it's it's a challenge almost every year to to raise the money to uh, uh, to to support these 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 organizations. Sure. My editor Dan Barton at the Wire, and uh, by the way, you can read uh, listeners. You can you can read this whole list on the on the Wire, uh, which is a uh, what do you call it? Digital newspaper, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a digital newspaper. Um, I find it. Um, I'm, I'm a subscriber. Yeah. Um, I find I find their uh, information to be uh, much more in depth than um, what I get from the uh, daily uh, reg, <clears throat> which has a tendency to do headlines and press releases, re just regurgitating press releases. These folks at the wire, they ask really, good questions. Oh, and, they ask good questions and they write good stories. Yeah, uh, and they're always very in depth. They really get. Um, into the issues, uh, I would encourage anybody uh, who wanted to give a Christmas gift to give them to give a subscription to the Wire as as a gift. It, it's uh, it's I think it's a, I think it's terrific, um, and um, you know I'm pretty hard on on journalists. So I <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> no, no, I, you know, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, um, I I like this pay. I really like this paper. So. I think it's about fifty bucks for the year. I mean, yeah, fifty or fifty-five. What they done with the hundred grand, they should have given out uh, um, two thousand um, gift cards uh, to the gift wire. Gift cards to the wire. Gift, gift subscriptions to the wire. People would have found out what the heck's going on around, on around town. You know, one of the things about this list, uh, which is actually central to it, is that uh, there's a lot of people on there who are not in the paper, as you point out. Uh, they're not in the paper every other day. Uh, they're not putting out press releases. They're not, you know, famous people. Uh, a lot of them are um, people, just people I know. My barber's always in here. Uh, my dent, my dentist is in here. Uh, so some of the characters that I run into in in my job. There's a uh, there's a roller rink. Uh, 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 I I don't know how to describe her. She's a she's she's a roller rink person and she competes in in, in uh, contests and her name is her her nom de skate as she calls it is Jane Bondage. Jane Bondage. And you yes. would you would not get you would not want to bump into Jane. She's uh she's she's tough. Whoa. And so sometimes you combine things like in this case stock and Len Bernardo's roller rink. Yep, yep. Which has been up and down. That was supposed to be on the ballot. Uh, uh, Bernardo wants to unload his roller rink. I think the roller to, rink is actually unloaded. Has it been? Because I think it was withdrawn. Uh, the uh, for some reason they chose not to go to referendum with it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm going. No, it's the new owners. I think that want to turn it over to the town. The people who bought it from Len. Ah, okay. I okay. believe <clears throat> want to um, have it as a town recreation. Say, well, it could, it could be the town hall. Town it's office. big. It's going to be town offices and town rec center. They're going to take the. Um, they're going to. I believe they're going to leave the uh, the rink and they're going to take the. Um, there's a, a, a roller blade. Uh, uh, park or something I think they're going to convert oh. into uh, town offices. It's a beautiful facility. Have you ever been in there? Sure. Yeah. I was there sh uh, 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 <laughs> just a little before um, uh, the control of March Gallagher. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Trying, yeah, that, story, just, that story has... I trying to get a job because I understood they were under uh, underemployed. Yeah. But that she came in there and lied through her teeth. And, that story and, is has been re rerun and respun, and, and, I, and I don't even know what the truth is anymore. It's the epitome of Ulster County dirty politics. <laughs> That's what that one was. <laughs> Just a couple of just a couple of mothers looking looking for uh, just a couple of yeah looking for, for, a, for a party site for their yeah, kids yeah that's place. that's a, that's all it was. How many people do you have working here? Because everybody walked in the place asked how many people they had working there. Like two, right? And what they, yeah, they asked the kid who's popping the popcorn, <laughs> and then, uh, who's know. taking tickets at the yeah, same time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He does more than one job, so he counted twice. Multitasked, so, young man. But it was just you know that that was that was about as low as I've seen local politics get. But anyway, uh, it worked, so that's good. Any, anyway, uh, how about uh, 
How about Father Edmund Burke? You got groundbreaking at the Irish Cultural Center. Father Burke is Father, Father Burke is my priest, and and uh, uh, I I think he gives the best sermons. He's pithy, and he's to the Down point. Down at St. Peter's in Rosendale, correct? Yes. He used to be at St. Mary's. Yes, he was at St. Mary's. In Kingston. Okay. And 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 he's an Irishman, obviously with a name like Burke, and he was one of the driving forces behind this Irish Cultural Center which is entering its eighth year now of uh, development or non-development. Well, Huey, they're, they're only 15 years behind the uh, group that's out in Shandaken trying to build a, <laughs> a, a ski hotel. So, you know, you got to be patient. The bad news there for them, you know, you know connecting dots here, Kat, you know. <laughs> The bad news that for their for them is that Kathy Nolan, who was their arch enemy and held it up, I mean almost personally, mm -hmm. held that project up and fought tooth and nail in, in every every court in the in the state. Um, she's back as a county legislature, and she's reinvigorated. You know what the folks um, the folks who um, elected her. Uh, she, I think, was a major recipient of the uh, weekenders being allowed uh, and encouraged to vote in Ulster County mm. because <clears throat> um, when you speak to the locals, they actually want that project. That's jobs for them, their businesses, their employees, everybody out there, the little guys are going to uh, benefit but when when they um when there's this big movement on to get folks from new york city to re-register in ulster county and vote in ulster county uh, and most of them were weekenders i think she was a major recipient because they are completely at odds with the locals and i just don't see how local people out there would be against that, against that. Whereas uh, these folks who come up here, they want, um, they want the pristine. They mm -hmm. want, you know, and they don't, and, and and they really don't care if, the, you know, the uh, guy living living down the road in a trailer, you know, uh, is making, you know, uh, or is driving in Kingston to make a living. Yeah. 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 So that's uh, that's a shame. But yep, yeah, they're 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 screwed now. But so much money, so much wasted money there. How about Father Merrick uh, at Immaculate Conception? Father Merrick. I didn't get this one. I know Father Merrick. I love Father Merrick. But elevator shoes? Father Merrick uh, <coughs> is of average stature. It, it, it doesn't have to do with his height. It has to do with uh, his, uh, his, his biggest project is to put an elevator oh. in, in, into the, uh, the, the former Immaculate Conception school and to open up that top floor, which oh. is which is a gymnasium. Oh, okay. It's beautiful, okay. beautiful room, uh, to, to to open it up for uh, church events and community events and all that. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, and um, he's been raising money slowly uh, for a couple of years now. How how um, uh, is the school still? The school's not no. operating, right? No. Okay. I think there's one Catholic school left. They're yeah. uh, Catholic. What's it called? Catholic school, yeah, of course, from St. Mary's. Yeah, yeah, right. It used to be the St. Mary's, but yeah. then they closed St. Joseph's and they closed Immaculate Conception. There's nothing. Yeah. St. Peter's. St. Peter's had a school. Yeah. yeah. What a shame. What a shame. So okay, so that's uh, that. That was the uh, okay. I got it. Now I'm starting to get there. Uh, Paul O'Neill. That's pretty straightforward. Fair-minded jurors for the trial of the century. Well, you know, many a truth and jest. That's going to be, I think, a sensational trial, and and I think both oh, yeah. both sides will be sharply questioning what they call voir dire when they when they examine uh, jurors, when the lawyers on both sides, um, yep. which uh, I like to I like to cite sometimes when 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 a when a verdict comes in, it's either surprising or unpopular or controversial, and I say, you know, folks, the system works. Uh, the system is that each side gets to examine lawyers, and if they, if one lawyer is better at it than the other one, and he gets a he gets a stacked jury on his side. Yeah, I think we're going to 
to see some um, some serious um, lawyering going on. Oh yeah, I think it's going to be great. Theater. Theater. I think we're going to see the best theater since Mike Cavanaugh was the district attorney. The other uptown lawyers would would take time off to, when 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 Mike was summing up his case or even arguing a case. He yeah. was. Uh, he was. I've been he, actually um, hoping that. Um, during the trial, that there would be a major uh, snowstorm. <laughs> Why is that? It's well, a, probably in January, or February. February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping for a major snowstorm so that uh, the sidewalks will be impassable. <laughs> oh, stop it! <laughs> so that the people. So the buses from Brooklyn can't want, come up here. Yeah. So the people <laughs> who want to convict him without any evidence, uh, you know, can stay home. Hey, speaking of judges, there's uh, there's there's some jest here. Oh, yeah. um, Brothers of the Robe. Brothers of the Robe, meaning judges. Don uh, Williams. Don Williams, ex-county ex Republican judge, and Brian Rounds, who have had the current current, current judge, Democrat, uh, and uh, who have had their uh, their issues with uh, appellate courts, and, yeah. and and we gave them rave reviews. The the <laughs> the emphasis on rave. Because it was the judges who were raving afterward. <laughs> that was, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Daryl from uh, Bren Automotive. Most people, why? Who I understand, Daryl. Daryl claims she was a tax deduction <laughs> for, <laughs> for all the money you spent on your cars down there. You know, he. I have to send him a ten ninety nine. <laughs> Daryl sold me his wife's Mercedes. You know, it's an old one. I'm not rich enough like you are to have a modern Mercedes. But I'm driving a 2013. Yeah, you're barely getting by with it, with an old car. Yeah. And mine is a 06, but it's a beautiful car, and it was Daryl's wife's car. That and was a smart move, you. I One of my few uh, this year, and uh, believe me, it's... Uh, He's a top-notch mechanic. He's the best. He guaranteed that his wife's car was, was humming. A, that yes, thing hummed. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I have to check the. Uh, uh, I, I have to check when it's running because it doesn't make a sound. Oh man. So oh, if he sweet. if he does come across another one, I'm I'm pretty happy with what so I got. Here's another nice Mercedes for you know who. Okay, that that would be you. So Ryan Reynolds made the list this year at ten points per game. So My boy, he, he hasn't. He, he hasn't scored 10 yet, but it, yeah, he did score 10 twice. Uh, this kid, my grand, my grandson, who lives in Glenmont, he's on the varsity basketball team, and he and his father, since birth, I think I, 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 I think his father put a basketball in his hands when when he yeah, was born, yeah. and they've they've had this dream of this kid playing varsity basketball, and it's here. He's a senior, yeah. and he they, they lost their whole season last year. That was dev oh, yeah. devastating. I mean, you know, they only get one junior season, and it's it's touch and go this year with different restrictions and changes in schedules and the, the limiting uh, the number of people who can uh, who can attend a game and and all that. And um, he was uh, when I when I wrote this about a week ago, two weeks ago, he was uh, he was pretty much riding the pines for most of the games that I went to, which was severely disappointing. But then he broke out, and uh, he uh, he's uh, he's a good ball player. I mean, I like to think I'm a I'm a judge. I, I watched his father play at Kingston High School, yeah. and and I like bas I played basketball in high school too. And uh, his father says he's much better than than Robbie was. Wow. Which, which uh, Robbie was a sixth or seventh man. Do you want to bring the Cahill brothers in on Christmas oh, Eve? Oh yeah, what's that all about? Well, you know, the Cahill brothers are, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, I think there were 10 Cahills, and there's not nine now. I think uh, one of the brothers died. But uh, they, uh, they, they like, like, like we all do as we get older, we struggle a bit with uh, weight issues. And uh, Kevin can go up and down. Ke oh. Kevin can lose the weight as fast as he gains it. And then uh, uh, Brian, too. And uh, it, it's it's uh, they're 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 currently on the upswing, uh, the both of them. <laughs> and uh, as brothers, I know they kid each other a lot about who's who's got the bigger belly, or in this case, the bigger pants. <laughs> so, um, just very quickly, um, this is uh, the uh, Friday Mario and Me show on WGHQ Kingston Community Radio.
Our number is 331-9255. We're getting tired of hearing each other. We would love to hear from anybody out there in radio land. To a point. All right. Anyway. Um, oh, here's a good one. Um, in, um, in, in one of my several uh, year-end boo-boos, I uh, omitted Jim Satile as an ex-mayor. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jim politely informed me, as did many of my readers. All righty. Good morning, caller. Yes, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Happy holidays uh, you. to you both. Uh, I'm immensely enjoying the show thus far. Uh, uh, and as always, uh, but Mr. Reynolds, your Christmas column is something that I look forward to every year. And uh, I, I think it really speaks volumes to the importance of local journalists covering our local community um, because you truly know the people. Um, and, and boy, does this show it uh, uh, in, in such a wonderful way. That's my comment. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and now I have a question for, for both of you. Uh, in the name of local journalists and, and the importance of that, um, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on social media and the way that it now covers and can impact our politics. And what I mean is that any Yahoo can <laughs> write something and... We hey, wait a minute. Click. But wait a minute, caller. I have a blog. Did you call me a yeah, Yahoo? Well, I, 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 well, you are a true Yahoo. You're, right, you're right. A, a true journalist. <laughs> I'm a professional a Yahoo. Yahoo. Thank you. Uh, you know, but a, a, anyone can write anything they'd like be it true or false, and with one click, it can just take off. And unfortunately, uh, you know, everyday folks can't always decipher between the fact, the fiction, the true journalists, and, and coverage versus uh, someone just putting things out there. So here's my question for you. Uh, do you have any thoughts or comments on the, the impact, potential impact of social media in this way? Um, the way that it covers our politics and maybe your thoughts on really the importance of local uh, journalists, journalism. Um, I think we need them now more than ever and just wanted to ask your thoughts on this. Thank you and happy holidays. Well, th thank you, caller, and happy holiday to you. Um, we, could, uh, we could probably do the next uh, three hours uh, if, uh, if Maxwell would hang around long enough <clears throat> to keep us on the air on this particular subject. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's vast. Um, one of the things that the Founding Fathers feared was what they called the mob. They were very concerned about that, uh, that the, the, the so-called mob, the emotional um, uh, uh, swayed uh, by, by any, uh, uh, any issue, uh, would, uh, would just, uh, uh, in any case, um, here's an example. Uh, of, I'm kind of I'm forming my thoughts here, but uh, the role that, that that responsible journalism has played is it's a kind of gatekeeper. There 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 are people when I worked at uh, in the old days as it is now, uh, and other newspapers. These these were veteran journalists who who in many cases uh, were uh, had come up through the ranks, uh, had been reporters, had been on the street, had 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 covered the news live, and then um, uh, the more talented ones. Uh, became uh, editors, and they knew their communities, and they knew the issues. And y to get through the, even for reporters to get past these editors, if you filed a story that was the least bit kind of suspicious uh, or wasn't really uh, vetted, uh, wasn't really researched, an editor would literally hand it back to you and say, "Go back and ch you know, check this out." And that's not there. This is this is wide open. It is, a, in a sense, a form of pure democracy. Anybody can get their name in a paper, as it were. They, they can just file it. And whether it's true or not, there's other people who, uh, 
who are going to buy into it. Uh, Mario, I'll let you have a word on this, but I want to I want to bring this up. Um, <clears throat> one one of the uh, one of the ongoing stories now uh, in connection with the with the, with the co with the COVID is that there are people who are anti-vaxxers who wind up getting COVID. And if they're public officials, they could be a governor. I think there was, a, there was cases, uh, members of Congress, et cetera, uh, prominent people who, who are against vaccines or uh, slash mandates, uh, they get COVID. And so th uh, that becomes a big story. Well, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, when Governor Hochul uh, issued, I think it was on a Friday, so two weeks ago, Governor Hochul issued a mandate uh, requiring masks uh, indoors and uh, uh, and coming with it thousand dollar fines for they could impose I doubt if anybody's going to pay the fines and, and in any case uh, the Dutchess County executive uh, a man named Molinero who was also running for Congress uh, in our in our district um, issued a statement that he would not enforce the the mandate mm -hmm. because his sheriff's department was already up to its uh, up to his neck in uh, in work. He didn't have the manpower, and the state was not providing any resources for for them going to go around and to gatherings and uh, arrest people who didn't have masks on, etc. Uh, that story, that that story, which was legitimate enough, the uh, whether you agreed or disagreed with with Molinero's position. Uh, and I think the other three counties surrounding Ulster County also took the position, a, a similar position. Somebody put up on the web that that Molinero uh, had contacted uh, uh, COVID, and so that became a story. And that and 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 it's one thing to put it in the in a newspaper, which you might find fifty thousand readers. If you put it out on the web, you could have a million uh, clicks on that story in a minute, and. Uh, Molnero went a little nuts about it. He, uh, he he accused the Democrats of lying about him and so forth. So there is that. So, you know, they used to say you can't believe everything you read in the newspaper. Well, from experience, you can believe most of what you, <laughs> more than most, you can believe, you can believe uh, what, what what the newspapers put out uh, in days gone by. You, you could read, you could believe most of it. It, it 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 wasn't anybody had had access now even letters to the editor were uh were also vetted uh which is which is a the writer's personal opinion which is essentially what 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 goes out on the blog uh, it is what it is it is it it's going to be what it is uh, uh going forward and uh uh caller uh i don't have an answer uh, I try to make everything I put out there as accurate as possible. I make mistakes. Sometimes people comment on it. Sometimes people pass it on. Um, it's uh, it's it's the times the, that we live in. Mario? Yeah, uh, caller. Um, essentially, what you're you're asking is a really good uh, question because uh, uh, Congress and and uh, our uh, uh, leaders have been asking the same questions, and that is. Who controls content? And um, evidently, um, part of the problem is that um, a lot of the uh, social media uh, sites do not have um, the ability to uh, verify content. So, as a consequence, <clears throat> it's become a it's become a weapon. Uh, in the last two national elections. Uh, stories were leaked. Um, uh, just the whole Russian hoax deal went, went out all over the internet without anybody ever verifying any of it. Um, and they tried to, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact the uh, Trump campaign uh, by doing that. Uh, there were stories that were leaked about Biden in the last election that were unverified. It's um, it's the the problem that we have right now is too much control by social media, too much information being disseminated without um, without being uh, uh, verified. The pro and and the second problem is that some of the print media, the people that we used to respect, and the TV uh, uh, journalists the Walter Cronkites of the world, they're gone. 
uh, and uh, you know, Exhibit A is MSNBC, um, which is you know a disaster of a, in my opinion, of a of, of, of a TV station, <coughs> because all they do is um, um, repeat stories. They don't investigate. They don't seem to investigate anything. They have a complete bias, and that's. The problem, the problem that we have in the country right now is, yeah, you're right. The average, uh, the average Joe out there doesn't spend a lot of time. They put on a station, they listen to something, and they take it as uh, being the gospel truth. Uh, and in many cases, it's uh, completely biased news. And we have that locally as well, by the way. Even, even our uh, uh, formerly esteemed local newspaper has, um, has a bias. So, uh, you know, it's hard. It's, it's very difficult. And people respond sometimes when they can't have an impact on, on print, journalist, print journalism. They go online and they, and, 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 and they give their opinions. But um, it should always, any, anybody listening, anybody reading these things should always understand that these are mostly opinion pieces. Very seldom are they um, well thought out journalistic, uh, 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 written, uh, journalistically written uh, uh, pieces of, of good information. Very seldom. I'll, I'll give the Wall Street Journal a plug. They're, they're one newspaper that seems to really stay above the fray and give you straight content. But, uh, you know, New York Times is getting embarrassing. Washington Post is not much better, <laughs> you know. How about the New York Post, if you, if you want some slanted news? Well, New York Post goes the other way. Yeah. The, the New York Post is, uh, you know, very oriented and conservative. I like, what I like about the New York Post is uh, the sports. I think they have the best sports columnists in the, in the country, uh, bar none. They, they're, they're, their sports coverage is... I like their, I like their columnists, even though they're, they're all coming from the same direction. They're, 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 they're columnists. They're, they're identified... As columnists, this is their opinion, yeah. and they they have a story to tell. Uh, I don't want to read a, a front page news story that is somebody's opinion. Yeah, somebody's opinion. Exactly. Uh, you know, if I want opinions, I'll go to the editorial page and you know read read, read those, or I'll read columnists. But Sorry. but what you get is a narrative, and anything that anything that doesn't feed the narrative on either side, left or yeah. right, um, uh, isn't uh, is is excluded. So not only are you getting Propaganda, mm -hmm. but but you're you're not getting all the facts of a situation. Yeah. I know I was taught even as a column writer. Um, I was taught actually in high school. My high school teacher uh, for my uh, I think it was world history essay. And she said um, I was a, I, I was only good at a few things in high school, and well in history and English were were, were my fortes, and. Um, she said to me, um, you know, you should really, uh, you, she, she said, you should get 100% on this Regents. She says, you know this stuff as well as I do. She says, but you're a little weak in essay writing. Well, I was 17, and I hadn't written anything like that. And so she, she, she gave me a formula, which, which I used with all my columns, and certainly with the Freeman editorials that I wrote, is that would, 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 would lay out the proposition, this is the controversy, this is what one side says, this is what the other side says. This is an editorial, and this is what we think, and this is why we think so. And the reader would get, they may not agree, they don't have to agree, but the reader would, would, would have a real, I think, a good understanding of the issue. And then the reader would talk to his friends or his wife or his spouse, uh, would have a good understanding. It wouldn't be like, this is what we think, and you go right down the left side or right down the right side, and in the end, the reader... Is I, I is not well informed. Yeah, I hear you. So we should mention that we have a supervisor <coughs> Quigley coming in for the second hour. We're going to talk about this uh, this uh, Tech City uh, uh, situation, and um, I I we you know I think we're going to entertain some questions, hopefully from the listeners uh, about this project. He seems to be pretty well informed about what's going on. 
and that's a that's the, that's a real big uh, you know that's a that's a real big deal. So I think one of uh, one of you know one of Quigley's strengths. We could say it in front of him, but one of Quigley's strengths. Uh, he's he's often rightfully cited for his uh, financial acumen, but the other is as you just as you just said, uh, he's probably pretty well informed about this. I think I don't think a <laughs> I don't think a car moves in the in the town of Ulster that he's not pretty well informed about it. He he's on top of stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. I've I've seen a lot of supervisors who who just kind of mail it in. They show up <laughs> for town board meetings. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, I. Uh, I, you know, one of the things that there was a very nice article in The Wire this week um, about um, uh, March Gallagher, uh, who's um, concerned about the, um, about the Tech City transfer. She's not sure that it was done um, uh, according to script, according to the state law. So that's uh, that's very interesting. I want to get his perspective on that because um, <clears throat> you know. So so here's the deal. You know, I think we all agree. You and I, at, at least, agree mm -hmm. that March has aspirations uh, moving up into the uh, executive, executive suite. Office, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and so <coughs> along comes Ryan. This is probably the coup de gras of of Ryan's. Um, um, first two years in an office, whatever, how many years, I don't even know how long he's been around, but, um, yeah. Three so, years, three years, actually. Three years, and, you know, he pulls off this thing that his predecessor, you know, watched happen. He comes along and makes it happen. He, uh, you know, apparently there's some movement here. We got a quality developer, this and that. Well, you know, she can't let that go because... You have to, you know, how how do I get some press out of this? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> because all of a sudden, you know, Ryan owns the 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 local press, and that's all they want to talk about. So she drops the bomb. It was very interesting. The Freeman didn't even cover it. The Wire did, but the Freeman didn't even cover it. They had a couple of paragraphs from her where uh, she really uh, she pulled her punches, as it were. She expressed concern, to use the word, about the process <coughs> that has brought us to this point, yeah. and uh, and 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 she uh, she expects that if it is successful, uh, that uh, people will roll their eyes, as as she put it in the, in the Freeman piece. It was it was buried in the, in, the, in the back of the story. Yeah. So she basically got PYA uh, or is it CYA? Uh, cover yourself. Yeah, and, and what she's saying is that it was supposed to and should have been uh, assessed before uh, it was uh, sold to this new company. She's Ginsburg has been suing everybody in sight for the last 20 years, and this place has been assessed and over-assessed and, 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 yeah. and, and, and sworn testimony in court. I think they have a pretty good idea what it's worth. And she wants to, <coughs> well, she wants to know what's going to happen if the assessment when they finally do it they have they have to they're going to do it during the 90 day uh, uh, quiet period when the transactions being formulated and and, and, and uh, she wants to know uh, what's going to happen if the assessment is higher than uh, the uh, the purchase price and the Elster County um, citizens get screwed. I say that we would have made out giving them the property because like we gave it to Ginsburg. We got to get it back on the on, on you got to get it back on the tax rolls and whatever we get out of there we weren't getting from Ginsburg. He owed the county 12 million dollars in back taxes which we ate. <laughs> well, the county ate it. The town We're the county. It. Yeah, I know what I'm, what I'm saying is yeah, I mean just <clears throat> anything has got to be better than Ginsburg. I mean, this is just, you know, anything but Ginsburg should be the uh, ABG. A ABG, that'll be the new uh, symbol. You know, Kat, that's a pretty low standard, to, you know, to, to, to launch from. <laughs> anything but Ginsburg. <coughs> <coughs> Very interestingly, when my brother-in-law was assemblyman, he was the assemblyman, John Guerin, 
during this transition period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he absolutely warned, he absolutely warned Ulster County. You can go back in the archives of the Freeman. He was dead set against letting this guy Ginsburg get, get this property because of his reputation south of here. Somehow he had managed to do some investigative reporting, which nobody else seemed to do. And they were all hailing uh, Ginsburg as, you know, um, as some sort of a white knight. And um, my brother-in-law, to his credit, John, was like, this guy is a black knight. This is not, <laughs> this is not going to work. This is really bad stuff here. And, uh, and uh, he's, not a, he's not a, you know, he's not a quality guy. And he's, you know, and um, they wouldn't listen. Because they, they, everybody was sure that Ginsburg was going to turn this into the next IBM, and uh, guess who was right? <laughs> you know. Okay, what do we got? We got a call. Okay, good morning, caller. Uh, good morning. On your last show, I had uh, asked a question, and I haven't uh, heard any rebuttal on it, and that was whether or not the recreation uh, area of the IBM property is also a part of this deal, if you remember, the IBM Rec Center? Well, yes, we heard that, and um, Speaker, uh, the, uh, we, ha the, uh, we have the su town supervisor on yeah, at 8.05. I, I thought and maybe you guys, could, you guys could approach that question. We are going to, that's going to be the first question we're going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the other, the, other, the other question is, or not really a question, is that since the ribbon cutting and the uh, Ryan had had the uh, podium set up, I have noticed that the aspect of BOCES being one of the people taking quite a large footprint out of that deal is now um, obviously missing from, uh, you know, the Daily Shed and everything. There's like no mention that BOCES is going to be even, you know, a tenant out there. And my question going back was, that BOCES approached all the school districts and was going to um, look for money to start a renovation over at the Port Ewan Center. And all of a sudden now that's disappeared, like, you know, like the cat's out of the bag. So that was the other question. So I'll let you guys uh, continue and so let me, break. Let me just clarify what you're asking. Uh, uh, did you say that BOCES has stopped construction at, at the... Uh, Site no, no, in Port no, not stop construction, but they had they had pulled the local school boards here, and Kingston had voted on it. They're looking for a major renovation over at the Port Ewan site. Ah, okay. And and my question was, you know, if they're going to eventually here move out to Tech City, or you know, I eighty four now, whatever it's called, <laughs> is that are the taxpayers going to be paying for this renovation in Port Ewan, and then you know, and then they're going to vacate the building if this is the plan. You know, like, yep. you know, here to, here, you know, somebody else paying my renovation. Sure. You know? Kind of like. Okay, that was my other question. Yeah. And I, I've noticed that it's been, obviously, you don't hear anything about BOCES now. And Got it. Got when it. They, okay. When they had the ribbon cutting, they were one of the largest uh, organizations that was going to take a, a piece of the action out there. Yep. All and, right. So. You know, I um, forgot what it was, like, some, like, 74,000 square feet or something they were. Yes, so we're looking at moving huge, into. huge. Well, you know what? Okay. We're gonna. I'm not sure that uh, we're gonna be able to get to that answer, but we yeah. will. <laughs> we will ask. We're gonna ask, and we know the man who might have the answers. He's, he's sitting. Here. He's sitting in the lobby. Yeah. yeah, he's he's the man. The only thing is that I gotta do. Maybe you can. Maybe you can give him a little pop in the back of the head and get him to move back in the city. <laughs> Thanks for that. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a neighborhood man. I've I've approached him personally and asked him. We go way back. We go back as kids, and I asked him to move into the city, and he just laughed at me. <laughs> you know, but uh, he's going to be a big mess for out there in town of Ulster. Yeah, like you said, he's, he's, he watches the numbers. The guy knows what's going on. You know, it's going to be interesting to listen to him. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Happy holidays. Right. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. How are we doing? Anyway, all right, so we got our work cut out for us. Give the number out once in a while. We got one more call and we got to go to break. 
Okay, quick call. We got we're gonna go to break in a minute. Hello, good morning, caller. Merry Christmas. Hey, good morning, Merry Christmas. Hey, I have a quick, very quick thing before you go to break. Um, so, I really appreciate your episode the other week when you were breaking down all the things that people weren't realizing about Tech City. Another one is that uh, Getty from uh, the Kingston Times he reported that um, there was an email from the developer where. They're predicting that 50% of the jobs created, you know, they, everyone says 1,000 jobs are going to be created. Yes. But 50% of those are going to be minimum wage. Up. Uh-oh. And what I, what I don't understand is, you know, we, we can't fill the minimum wage jobs we have now. People can't live on that here. So where are these 500 people going to live who are going to make minimum wage at this plant? And why are we going to give a pilot to create minimum wage jobs that people can't live on? That's all. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yes, thank you for the call. Okay, Lawrence, take it away. You're listening to Kingston Community Radio on WGHQ Kingston. On your radio at 920 AM and 92.5 FM and also online at mykcr.org. Hi, I'm Kelsey Grammer. Wounded Warrior Project supports injured veterans by connecting them with fellow warriors, by serving them through mental health and wellness programs, and by empowering them to live on their own terms. No one should face a battle alone. Join us at WoundedWarriorProject.org. We are lions. We bring hope where it's needed, support causes that matter, change lives, change communities, change the world. Visit LionsClubs.org to learn more. Long ago, you wouldn't think of galloping on a horse while doing calligraphy, and you wouldn't have attempted to ride your bike while typing a letter. Yet, you think you can safely operate a multi-ton vehicle while texting? Behind the wheel is no place to multitask. If you want to BRB, drive now and text later. Lives depend on it. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Introducing the YMCA. Sure, you know the Y for a swim or a game of hoops, but we're more than that. We're a cause. When you take a jump shot at the Y, someone else is getting job training, practice yoga, as a team practices her leadership skills. We give people of all ages, incomes, and backgrounds a chance to learn, grow, and thrive. So while you might think of the Y as the place for lifting weights, we're also about lifting entire communities. That's the Y. We're so much more. Visit ymca.net slash more. Hi, this is Tony Marmo from Norman Staffing, and we've been bringing together employers and job seekers since 1980. If you're an employer and have job vacancies, let Norman Staffing help fill them with permanent or temporary workers. We screen, interview, and recommend the best candidates for your company. We make the employment process easier and faster for you. Please call Norman Staffing for your employment needs at 338-9111, 338-9111, or normanstaffing.com. This is Winnie from the Rosendale Seniors, and I support Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. This portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Visit their newest branch, conveniently located at the Ulster Commons Plaza in Lake Katrine. Experience the difference that local community banking offers with the convenience of another great location, easy access, plenty of parking, and a 24-hour ATM. Ulster Savings Bank, invested in community, invested in you. Member FDIC. This okay, we're savior. back. Okay, folks. Save that back. line about Phil and for the broadcast. <laughs> that time of the day where we do birthdays. So, um... We have some special birthdays because folks um, are, there are a number of birthdays of people that were born on Christmas Eve. How, how exciting is that? So I think they get chipped. That's no question. Let's, let's, let's see, let's see who we've got today. So we've got a happy birthday to Carol Mazzone. Love from Marianne and William Banks, Jr. 
Happy birthday, Carol. Then uh, we have, we are so grateful to send happy birthday greetings to Phyllis Rosner on her 83rd birthday. God, Phyllis, happy 83rd. We love you very much from your daughters, Linda and Rhonda. We love KCR's program as well as ice cream cow pies. We wish everyone a wonderful year always. Thank you so much, Linda and Rhonda, and congratulations to Phyllis on her 83rd. We have Joe Eshman this morning who has a birthday, and she's getting greetings from her friends at People's Place. We hope you enjoy your special day. Happy birthday, Joe. <clears throat> and People's Place, very busy today because Toby Gabriello <coughs> also has a birthday, and uh, the People's Place folks hope she has a special day. And then we have the winner of the famous Boys Dairy Milk House Cow Pie for today, December 24th, and it's Phyllis Rosna. Happy birthday again, Phyllis. You may pick up your uh, famous cow pie at the Boys Dairy Milk House. 62 O'Neill Street in Kingston, and that comes to you courtesy of the Boys Dairy Milk House and Kingston Community Radio, and I just want to add a plug here that we're going to whip out one of our cow pies that are frozen mm -hmm. for Christmas dinner tomorrow. Anyway, and now we have Christmas Day, and um, we have one birthday on Christmas Day, and it's to the birthday is for John Quick, who is celebrating his 75th birthday tomorrow. So please wish my husband, John Quick, a very happy 75th birthday. Love, Ruth. Also love and best wishes from your grandchildren, Wilson and Caroline. Uh, John, you are blessed. And a happy, happy birthday and Merry Christmas to John Quick tomorrow and as our only entry John is the official winner of the Boys Dairy Milk House famous cow pie for tomorrow happy birthday John and I have an announcement I have an announcement to make because we've got a big event coming up and we want to get that on on the news so we, this is to all legionnaires, auxiliary sons, legion riders, and spouses. You are all cordially invited to attend the Ulster County American Legion State Commander's Visitation Dinner, honoring Frank LaMarche on Friday, January 14th, 2022, at Rosendale's Tilson Post. Tilson, New York. The social hour will be 5 to 6 p.m. Dinner will be at 6 p.m. Tickets are $35. There's a cash bar. Dinner is a buffet. And please call 845-901-5196 before December 31st to reserve a dinner space. Again, that's 845 845- Nine zero one five one nine six, and you can be present at the state visitation. You, you and I are legionnaires, but I don't think I'm going to be in town, so you're going to have to represent us. I'll fill in for you, Ken. <clears throat> and then uh, we have you get them to pay for you too. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a uh, press release from um, the Sorgatis Sports Hall of Fame. They're having an induction banquet. So after a two-year hiatus due to the pandemic, the Sorgatis Sports Hall of Fame will resume their tradition of honoring those who have made a significant impact on Sorgatis sports history. As the Sports Hall of Fame enters its 59th year of existence in 2022, the induction banquet will take place on Saturday, April 9th. Doors open at 5 with a cocktail and greeting hour from 5.30 to 6.30, followed by dinner and induction at 6.30 p.m. at the Diamond Mills in Sorgatis. Our 2020-2021 and 
22 inductees from two years ago include Pat Caffrey, Jay Dodig, Mark Herb, along with Steve Einer Martin and Jimmy Spears. All are invited to come out and celebrate the achievements of this year's inductees. Tickets for the April 9th banquet are available by contacting <clears throat> Mike Hassenball uh, at 914-388-2348. Let me repeat that, 914-388-2348 or Mike Hassenball at yahoo.com. <clears throat> anyway, uh, and that comes to us from Greg Chorvis. <clears throat> Well, that sounds like a rocking event. So <laughs> we've got our we we've got all our announcements out of the way, and yet, folks, as we told you earlier, we're here, and our guests this morning, uh, <clears throat> our last show of the year, UE. So we brought back um, one of our favorite guests, if not our favorite, uh, Jim Quigley, uh, the town of supervisor. By, uh, by uh, way of full disclosure, I live in the town of Supervisor. So, I mean, I live in the town of uh, Ulster, <laughs> and um, my wife went to school with the Supervisor. I don't know what happened. I think she slept through a few of the classes, but he, he has never revealed the true story about what happened at Coleman High School that year. Anyway, James, good morning and Merry Christmas to you and your family and the town, the town board. And before we get to the questions, I want to say one thing. I pulled out of my driveway this morning onto a street that was pavement. I went down my hill and it was sanded. And I drove all the way to the town line and I was on clean streets and I hit the city of Kingston and it was nothing but a sheet of ice coming down Miller's Lane all the way to Lucas Avenue. Lucas Avenue wasn't even plowed which is a main thoroughfare, wasn't sanded, wasn't plowed and all I'm going to say about uh, the town board and Frank Petromal, our town superintendent is I, this is why I firmly believe that your town highway superintendent or public works superintendent should be elected and not appointed. And this is, uh, the city of Kingston, town of Ulster Line, is exhibit A in my belief. <laughs> well, I think, uh, first of all, in today's environment, there are a whole lot of different factors that are affecting the productivity of our employees and uh, I think the town board's uh, substantial support for the highway department in the town of Ulster that includes ordering trucks a year and a half before they're needed because of the fact that that's what the current production schedule is Wow! and the fact that every time we sit down the first question is what do you need uh, from the supervisor to the highway superintendent and uh, I think it goes a long way that we work in partnerships with the highway department, the highway superintendent and the employees of the town of Ulster. I passed on the way in Billy Williams who's making his rounds this morning for the water department at 7 o'clock here. I know he finished up late last night because I think there was a water main break on Old Neighborhood Road right in front of Jimmy Winchell's house down there at the end past Fowler Technologies. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty bad one. Um, they got in a hole, and uh, when they got down to the pipe, it was covered with blacktop. So in 1956, uh, the construction inspector must have been out on a lunch break when they backfilled that hole because they threw all the blacktop from the road right on top of the water line. So, oh, yeah. And we find this stuff all over the place. So, I mean, this is an indication that yeah, this has been going on forever with government. Um, we try to do things the right way the first time. And that hole was backfilled with clean uh, materials from the highway garage because that is our process, and that's how we do things in the town of Ulster. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank again. you, Frank, and thank you guys in the highway department for coming in this morning. It was great. <clears throat> and Frank's, uh, Frank, I've lived, <clears throat> I've lived in the town of Ulster for 50 years, and uh, <clears throat> I think Frank's probably the best highway superintendent I've 
had the experience. And he's recognized by his peers throughout mm -hmm. the county because I we sit there and we talk as a, as the president of the high, of the supervisors association. I get to talk to all the supervisors about their relationships with their highway superintendents, and I know his name is bantered about in the supervisors association as much as it is bantered about in the highway superintendents association. He's well respected by his peers. They always call him for help. In fact, uh, there was an accident the other day with another municipality's truck and the town of Ulster was called for assistance. So um, we are, first and foremost, the I will say the best highway department in the town. In Beautiful. The Thank you. Thank you for all you guys do. And I certainly, certainly appreciate uh, this highways. Uh, they, they, they're just the best. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we've had a call or call twice now. And, um, and the big question uh, is, before we get to the, uh, <clears throat> the Tech City uh, uh, situation, this caller would like to know the, um, the disposition of the um, IBM, um, would they have a club or a country okay. club or something? On Cuckoo Lane, yeah. Yeah. back in the... I guess the late 50s, early 60s, IBM bought a large track, which they developed as a recreation center for right. their employees. They had softball fields, they had tennis courts, they had the pool complex. When IBM left and uh, left town in the 90s, they sold that entire parcel to an individual by the name of Travis Rothline. My condolences go out to the Rothline family, as I understand um, Travis has passed away recently. Um, he eventually sold that property to Scenic Hudson. Scenic Hudson went into the site and eradicated all uh, remains of human habitation. They oh. took out everything that IBM had ever put it in to restore the land to its natural state. And um, that's where it stands today. Is it, it is. a park or anything? or It's forever wild. But is it accessible to the community? There's no post. There's no trespassing signs posted on the border. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Okay. And um, has the town ever thought about approaching them about making it the hiking trails or? Uh, Scenic Hudson has constantly approached the town about the town making its vacant land hiking trails oh. and offering assistance, but it's never gone in the opposite direction. I think if you look at. Um, the tax map <coughs> database throughout the counties in the Hudson Valley, you will find out that Scenic Hudson is one of the largest landowners in the Hudson Valley. And if you look at the parcels that they own, you will understand that they are forever green. They will never be touched by human hands. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're opened up for recreation, that's a matter of their board of directors making a decision to do. And uh, we've had discussions and we've, we've uh, offered up an idea that the town would be interested in sponsoring a municipal-based solar farm on 20 acres or so off of Cuckoo Lane. We're still waiting for answers to that question. Okay, so <clears throat> they're not really um, <clears throat> strong in the uh, uh, alternative energy department. Uh, this was an initial <clears throat> concept. It was a novel concept. It was the first time it was opened up to them. You know, they are the owners of a lar large area throughout the Hudson Valley, and they are very supportive of solar energy. I think the questions came about within their own organization is what can we do to, to foster the growth of it. And as one of the largest owners of parcels that are appropriate sites for solar energy, I think they have a responsibility of giving it serious consideration. And they don't pay any taxes, correct? They pay no taxes. They pay no taxes. Every time they buy something, they take it off the tax roll. And in fact, they did create a problem for the town when they bought that because they took 2% of the tax roll, 2% uh, of the value off the tax roll in the East Kingston Fire District. Oh, wow. And then when um, we took another hit when uh, the Hudson Landing Project was sold to Scenic Hudson as an intermediary for the state of New York to turn it into the Quarry Waters State Park that is going to be coming about here in the next year or so. Wow. So we continue to get uh, our tax base diminished all over the place from all sorts of, and it's not just Scenic Hudson, it's Woodstock Land Trust. They're buying properties on the western edge of the town that are adjacent to Saugerties and Woodstock's borders. Mm -hmm. 
and they're seeking to take them off to the tax rolls. Wow. So, and they and they require services. I mean, if there's a problem there, they're going to require that fire department to go out there and fix it. Yet they don't even pay like a, a pilot or anything. Nothing. No pilot. They have made voluntary. Cena cuts and has made voluntary contributions to the town to be passed through to the fire districts. Well, that's that's nice to hear. Okay, so tell us. Um, you got anything there, Huge? No, go ahead. I feel like I'm getting set up here. <laughs> so, do you uh, <clears throat> do you have uh, any thoughts on this uh, uh, <clears throat> this Tech City takeover? What what's good about it? What's bad about it? And um, what's still up in the air? Well, I hear everybody <laughs> asking, "Is it a good deal?" And they're asking. A very simple question to a very complicated problem. I don't look at it as a good or a bad deal. I look at it as do we have the optimum results based upon the situation of where we are today. So let's look at where we are today. We have a property owner who came to town with great promise. He didn't keep his promises. He came to a point where to avoid continuing the tax search, he decided he wanted to tear the buildings down. Uh, in the process of tearing the buildings down, they didn't follow the rules. They created surface contamination where there previously was no surface contamination. Um, and they continued not to pay their taxes, including taxes on parcels that they fought tax search for reactions over and were successful in having the values reduced. So you're sitting here, you have a contaminated surface site, contaminated by the actions of the owner. You have delinquent taxes. And in 2017, when Donald Trump took office and named Pete Lopez the head of Region 2, I made contact with the EPA and started conversations for enforcement actions, which, as you can see, ultimately resulted in a consent decree essentially being signed between Ginsburg and the EPA where he promised to take certain actions to complete the cleanups which in two years were not taken. So as that clock ticked away the EPA sat there and said we're not we're not standing still and they undertook in 2020 I believe it was between five and six hundred thousand dollars in remediation costs on their own to secure the areas around building one and um, they then leaned the property for recovery of those expenses. In 2021 they went to Washington and they were granted permission by the powers of what in Washington and the funding to conduct a 12 million dollar cleanup on that site. Now what would that do what would be the outcome if this transaction did not go through with national resources? The EPA would come in, they would clean up the site for $12 million, and under the statutes, they have first recovery on the value of the asset being liquidated to reimburse themselves for the expenses that they incurred in cleaning it up. Now remember, they estimated it's $12 million to clean it up. That's what they got agreement from Washington to fund. And they were already out five to $600,000, which they have a lien document for. So if at the end of the day, they finished up their cleanup, and then they went to liquidate the assets to recover their expenses, would they get their $12 million back? And if they did, what does that mean for the $10 million that was owed to the county for unpaid taxes? Yeah. So in other words, they would get their 12, if you look at the value that's being talked about today's, yeah. in today's transaction where it's $12 million, yeah. had the EPA cleaned it up, they would have been reimbursed and the county would have been out $10 million. Mm. And the property would have been sold to satisfy the obligations of the EPA. Got it. So where are we today? We are here today where we have a developer who has experience in this realm, who has agreed to pay the county 
twelve million dollars, of which seven million dollars for will be for environmental cleanup costs, and five million will be for reimbursement of taxes that are in arrears, which currently estimated about ten million dollars. So it's a fifty percent recovery to the county. The first demonstrated example was zero recovery to the county. Yeah. Now you're talking 50 cents on a dollar. Okay. Now, the question comes about is, why did the EPA develop a $12 million cost and the developers only had a $7 million cost? I've been asked that. We all know yeah. the pricing for government contracts. Yeah. It costs more. Sure. And, in addition, Building 1, which was the site of the aborted asbestos remediation. And building one is the clock building? No, it's the building behind the clock building. Right. This is the site where they had yeah, the right. errant asbestos, asbestos, asbestos cleanup, yeah. which resulted in criminal convictions. Mm -hmm. Okay? The EPA looked at that and they said that the most efficient way to clean it up was to demolish the entire building with the asbestos in it. Therefore, the entire debris pile resulting from that would have to be demolished or disposed of as contaminated waste. Well, the developer comes in and says, no, that is a functioning structure. I'm going to finish the asbestos remediation and renovate the building and rent it out. Uh -huh. So therefore, he reduced the EPA's estimate from 12 million down to X. Right. When he looks at the other piles, he's going through his math, I'm going to use so-and-so as a contractor as opposed to so-and-so that the government was going to use. Sure. There's a cost differential in there. Is it reasonable for that it's $5 million? Doesn't matter. He is signing an agreement when he buys this with the EPA that he will clean it up to their satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he's going to clean it up to their satisfaction and it's going to be on his dime. So I look at it at as, as a relative range of outcomes. Mm -hmm. In addition, I have been recently informed that Ginsburg is getting some money. So it's not just $12 million being paid to the county. It's $12 million plus some monies that are being paid to Ginsburg because Ginsburg still owes the EPA five to $600,000 for the lien. And there are other liens on the property that have to be cleaned up. And there are other expenses that have to be disposed of. So we're looking at probably a transaction value 15, 16, 17 million dollars wow. in total with all the cash being accounted for in the transfer of title. What happens to the property that was previously sold to the warehousing company down by the railroad tracks? There, that property remains in the possession of the people who bought it. They are subject to the restrictive covenant, covenants and easements that encumber the entire parcel because if you remember back we probably i don't think you were on the planning board in 96. i know you were on the planning board at one point in 96 the town of ulster planning board subdivided a single parcel owned by ibm into 27 separate parcels yeah, each parcel with the exception of the bank of america building represented a single building so the subdivision was to the building line and the resulting 95 acres on the east campus, which were the parking lots, green fields, and everything else, became known as the common area master parcel. And when, those, when that subdivision was completed, all the assessed value was laid into or applied to or allocated to the buildings, which resulted in five or six tax works tax certiorari actions over the 25 years. In 2016, the town lost the final tax certiorari action to the, uh, due to an appellate court decision where we ended up paying Mr. Ginsburg a half a million dollars in refunds from the town taxes and we had a liability of almost another million dollars if he had paid taxes on the buildings that he stopped paying taxes on. We can only refund taxes when the taxes are paid. So if they're not paid, we don't have to refund it. Um, fast forward, we finish. he finishes the demolition. The restrictive covenants set forth the fact that that master parcel is to provide parking to buildings that were on the site. 
Well, he just demolished the buildings. Therefore, they didn't need the they didn't need the parking. Therefore, the 95 acres is no longer worth zero. In 2017, we assessed the 95 acres for 4.7 million dollars. He didn't pay the taxes on that, and that ended up being after three years the reason that the county had a successful foreclosure against the East Campus because they were foreclosing against the entire campus, not just the buildings that had the value on it. Now, there was a, uh, a tax surgery court case heard in front of Judge Cahill in October of 2020 over the valuation of the 95 acres. And Mr. Ginsburg said we overassessed them and that we were not right in assessing him for a single dollar, let alone what we did, because it was still common area. Well, in a court decision that was released by Judge Cahill last week on the 21st, Judge Cahill agreed that the town's position was reasonable, that our valuation was reasonable, and he allowed the, uh, the assessment to stand, and therefore the delinquent taxes that had not been paid remained outstanding. Wow. And then the county eventually forecloses. This is, wow. It's wow. a, it's, it's a three-dimensional chess game. Yeah. Unbelievable. So, to your knowledge, what's going to happen with that property? Do you have any inside info or suggestions that you could throw out here and to the people who are listening about uh, what might, what, well, it, what we might be looking at in the future? I understand um, this is a dynamic situation. It is going to ebb and flow based upon what the market, and by that I mean the real estate market, tells us they want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I have always held out that that was an ideal site for a major distribution center. Amazon, whatever. And over the years we've had various levels of interest that were never capable of coming to any fruition for a distribution type facility. I know that I have articulated in the press that I did not want to see housing on that site. And the developer in his first statement made a statement that he would like to integrate a village-like concept with small tenant, commercial, and workforce housing on the site. Um, understanding that the town's government's role is not to be obstructive, um, I took advantage of his announcement and proposed to the town board that we double the impact fee for housing units from $1,500 to $3,000 two meetings ago. And yes, Yesterday when he was in my office and we talked about workforce housing, I basically said, look, I'm not going to stand in your way. I am transactional, and by the way, I increased your impact fee from $1,500 to $3,000 a unit. He just smiled. <laughs> there's a price if you want something. Yeah. Um, there's a price for it. And at the end of the day, I figure he will propose somewhere near 150 workforce unit houses, housing units in uh, along the Boises Lane area and that will generate for the town approximately $450,000 in income to be used for our recreation facilities. Does the town have any designs on any of that uh, property? Do you have any uh, thoughts or has there any consideration been given to using any part of that property? Uh, when the county foreclosed on the Bank of America building, that foreclosure included a vacant 57-acre parcel that was at the end of Old Boyce's Lane Extension. That was the proposed site for the Niagara Bottling Plant in 2013-2014. I immediately notified the county executive that the town had an interest in that 57-acre parcel for several reasons. The first reason is it sits right next to the Ulster Wastewater Treatment Plant the largest electrical consumer in the town and would be an appropriate location for a 20-acre solar farm, which would be to our advantage because we could feed the sewer plant directly. 
In addition, there are a number of soccer fields on Boyce's Lane that are used by the community. It's a matter of time before that land is redeveloped. And what we proposed to the county was to put soccer fields adjacent to the solar field. That left a three acre parcel or so, and I just penciled in a conceptual, this is a location for a future town hall. Okay. Now, we have gone through two rounds of solicitation by UCEDA from, the from interest in the community for this parcel. The town has submitted twice. We've submitted a schematic to them. We still don't have an answer from the county as to what they want to do with that 57 acres. They are in conversations with national resources for national resources to take over in some form of commercial transaction, and I can't tell you what it is because I don't know, the Bank of America building and the 57 acres. In yesterday's meeting with Mr. Cotter from National Resources, I laid out for him the town's plan, and I said to him, this is what we'd like to do, and this is why we'd like to do it. You're going to redevelop Boises Lane's land area. You're going to be removing the soccer fields. This is an appropriate location to replace them. Yeah, I'm sorry, two days ago I had that meeting. Yesterday morning he told me he agreed with me and he was going to work to the town to put together some type of transaction where the town could get title to the lands that we've expressed an interest in. I told him right off the bat from a commercial point of view, it doesn't make sense for me to put a town hall there, the town of Ulster to put a town hall there. I'm not going to advocate that. First of all, I'm not going to advocate to the town of Ulster taxpayers to go into debt for $15 million to build a new building. That is not in the current financial condition with a decreasing tax roll from an assessment-based perspective. I'm not going to recommend that. That's wrong. It's financially irresponsible. So we want to see, as we go about the redevelopment of Tech City and the Hudson Valley Mall, because we do have two distressed properties, mm -hmm. um, how this plays out and how the tax base in the town of Ulster is restored to a level that will give us the abilities to adequately finance our future home. Now, when Glidepath negotiated to put the battery storage facility on Frank Satile Boulevard, they have ownership interests in some land that is in front of the town of Ulster Transfer State. We told them that as a condition of their approvals, they had to transfer to the town this small, unusable portion of land to the town. And we will combine it with the transfer station property that we have up there. It is high on a hill outside the floodplain adjacent to existing town facilities. And I believe this would be an adequate location to put a new town hall. What do you think? It's a very interesting town of Ulster story. Um, can we uh, revisit something that came out in the initial uh, announcement of this uh, so-called IBM project? What's with uh, Ulster BOCES being relocated to that site? What do you know about that? I, re I know what I read in the paper, that Ulster BOCES has a need for space. I know from being a member of the committee that was advising UCEDA on the West uh, Campus that they had expressed an interest, and that is the extent. I know they're in the market. I know they're looking for the right facilities. Um, the question that everybody should be asking them is, is it the optimum outcome to force them into a 400,000 square foot multi-floor office building that was constructed for an industrial company as a means of cheaply satisfying their needs. Is that the right long-term decision? That's not a question that I can answer. But I understand at the same time that BOCES is soliciting support from its various members, seven or eight school districts, including Kingston, for funding to expand on, on their present site. That was, uh, the only thing I know is what was reported in the Freeman, and, that, and yes, I understand that. They're looking to do a construction project in the town of Asopus to expand their existing facilities. Well, which is it then? 
Are they moving to some vacant 400,000 square foot building and they're taking money from the school districts to, to renovate? I suppose we should have the BOCES guy here, maybe our yeah. our first. Uh, yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, okay. Let's, let's so let me ask you a question. When you play blackjack, does your opinion of what your hand is change when they turn the next card up? That's what we're essentially sitting here talking about. This is a game of different options being revealed at different points as the table changes. The cards on the table are changing. I know that the private developer who is interested in redeveloping Tech City will talk to any and every entity, including BOCES, including Ulster County Community College, including Bard College. He's going to talk to everybody and their brother to try to generate a cash flow from a lease on that parcel. That's the only so, uh, way. So is this, is, is this potentially a uh, uh, addition by sub subtraction operation where you're taking BOCES out of out of Port Huron, living in a gigantic hole. It's the biggest building in the town of Asopus, empty. Or you're taking Bard College is coming over here, or SUNY. So uh, it, it isn't adding to the base. You're not talking about, you're talking about the creation of new facilities that supplements or expands existing operations. <clears throat> well, let me make a suggestion. I don't see the expansion, I see transfers. Well, I. That may very well be true, and but we, as you adequately described, you're going to have to get the people from BOCES in here to answer the questions as to where's BOCES going. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so it, Ulster, um, Ulster County, since I've lived here, has talked about having uh, housing at Ulster Community College. Even when I was on the legislature, we talked about it, but there was no water out there. There's water now. There's water now, and is that is that do you are, are you aware of any consideration being given to possibly building a satellite campus that would include um, housing because that's a tremendous revenue source for the county. I thought we already had a satellite campus on Mary's Avenue in the Sophie Finn School. We do, but um, no that's housing what, there either. And how <laughs> many satellite campuses do we well, need with what, a declining enrollment? That's what you is saying. Is it going to be, let's build some housing and let's build a satellite campus and we'll close the one on Mary's Avenue? And that's the subtraction that we're talking about. Is are they just going to be picking off these projects? Um, and leaving empty buildings in their wake, and that's that's got to be a concern. You know, the other thing, the other thing I noticed, and I don't know if you've done this, but I actually went on their website and where they list all of their projects, and uh, they also they list their projects, they list their investment, and they list what they pay in taxes. And I I thought the tax bills were just a little lean in terms of, you know, paying a million dollars or a million and a half dollars in taxes on a $200 million project. So these folks, you know, um, may not actually be uh, the golden knights that they appear to be, if, uh, if I'm understanding this process. They, they've got the deal going on, but when they come back to do a project, they're going to be looking for IDA, uh, you know, um, considerations on everything. That's what it sounds like to me. It looks like they've done that every place else they've gone. Well, they very well may. And, but here's how I look at it. I have a property that's paying zero in taxes now because the county's going to own it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just what I, that's the situation we have with the West Campus. It's paying zero in taxes now. The National Resources Company comes in, and if they are successful in locating a million square foot distribution center, I will tell you right now that between the planning, zoning, and building department fees, the town of Ulster will be getting a recognized revenue stream of close to a million dollars in fees mm -hmm. over a number of years as that progress goes about. Yeah. I've disclosed to you that there is going to be uh, if he wants to put his housing on there, we've already we're moving towards putting a three thousand dollar a unit impact fee for recreational purposes. That's four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now I know that 
one of our favorite developers in this local community only pays about $150 per unit hmm. for senior citizen housing as this pilot, whereas recent deals have been $1,000 a unit. Now, if he puts 150 units in at $1,000 a unit, that's another $150,000 to the town. My, I have been elected by the town of Ulster citizens to protect the finances and run the town of Ulster. That's it. My responsibility stops at the property line, at the, the town lines. The decisions that the county and the school district make, that's theirs. I'm going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that we get an adequate financial return for everything that we're sacrificing in the town and that the people are taken care of. Wow. Should we reelect this guy, Yui? I was just thinking of that. It looks like a bumper sticker to me. <laughs> Sounds like a bumper sticker, right? Actually, I liked your listing in your Christmas list for my 2021 present with my wife. A long cruise. Yes. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Hey, good for you, James. Good for you. You know, what intrigues me uh, about this whole process is, uh, and I don't know if you were in at the beginning, beginning. Obviously, you're in it now, and, and, and you've been in it. How, what was the spark? Was it, was it Brian going to Fiskill with his executive staff and, and pitching this thing to these guys who were, really weren't interested at first? First of all, you got to understand, who put them in the position to be able to take control of the property? It was the actions of the town of Ulster Town Board and the assessor's office that fought tooth and nail that played every delaying game possible with the tax surgery actions in the court to the point that Ginsburg ended up losing the properties. It was the town of Ulster that put the valuations and then came up with the novel economic argument to the judge as to, to, to justify that valuation that resulted in taxes on a parcel that formally paid no taxes. On top of that, it was the town of Ulster that called the EPA because Ginsburg was using the demolition to piles as a deterrent to foreclosure because he knew the county wasn't going to step in and foreclose on him if they had to clean up. Okay? So I delivered to Pat Ryan and the Ulster County government the opportunity to make lemonade out of lemons. And to his credit, somebody whispered in his ear, told him to go see Joe Cotter, and the rest is history. Okay. Uh, circling back on something that Catalano raised, um, this uh, workforce housing. Um, you know, they proudly announce and repeat and repeat and repeat that it, this, this, this operation is going to create 1,000 new jobs. Well, that's always good news. But then you dig a little deeper into the press release and you discover that half these new jobs pretty much minimum wage. Are these the kind of jobs that we've already done that up on the hill with the with the box stores. We're going to repeat it down by the railroad tracks. The box stores are gone. Exactly. The box stores are gone because the the retail environment changed and the fundamental economic situation within our market area changed to the point that the disposable income that was in the community could no longer support the amount of retailers. I mean, it, I've been repeatedly asked what happened to the mall. Well, Bottom line is, when you looked at the mall's tenant list, most of the tenants were servicing the teenage top portion of the population, you know, with fashion. Well, our teenage population went down. The income went down. Therefore, they couldn't justify it. Well, Jim, these are, these are policy issues. These, you know, we understand that history. And, and, you know, things change, obviously. It's a, as you put it, it's a dynamic situation. But when we're sitting at a conference table like the guys in Greene County did and said, this is, this is what we have, we want, we want, we want jobs that, that, that support our community, not, not these $15 an hour jobs with no benefits and a huge, huge turnover. This is essentially what this guy's proposing. Five, half these 1,000 jobs, quote unquote, nobody wants. I don't know if you can force a guy into it. I mean, as an ex <laughs> another example, you're you're talking about housing. If if you want something, you're going to have to pay for it. Okay, that's a policy thing. 
Our policy, your policy apparently is you don't want housing on that site, and if you want housing on that site, you're going to pay for it. Cool. That's okay. It's on the table. Why not put on the table? We don't want fifteen hour, fifteen dollar an hour that's jobs. The, that's not the responsibility of the town of Ulster government. If the county, if the county IDA, in considering a pilot for that that site, comes to a conclusion they want to enforce a policy decision. They're the appropriate party to put the rule, the, the requirements in. They're already the ones, the agency that is, if you promise me 100 jobs, you're going to deliver me 100 jobs. Or there's clawbacks to the benefits. Those are in the IDA documents. If they want to extend that, then they can extend that to include, well, we don't want any jobs less than $25 an hour. I just want to remind the listening audience number of years ago, the IDA promoted a policy that uh, oh, yeah. under they March, wanted under, prevailing wage. Under on, March Gallagher. On, they add, wanted prevailing yeah. wage on every new project. Well, guess what? We yeah. didn't see a project for three years. Yes. Okay? We have to take and be conscious of what the market is. If we, we may not like it, but the best thing we can do is to try to do... Uh, to construct something where these people have an opportunity to grow, okay? You look at Amazon's advertisements. Yes, they're bringing them in at fifteen, eighteen, twenty dollars an hour for their warehouse workers. Is that adequate? Probably. In the light, in light of a living wage and the way it's calculated in this uh, county under the CARES criteria, no. But they gave them full health, full health insurance. What's that worth? They pay for college education. What's that worth? Okay? You look at the intangible benefits. The hardest thing as a supervisor is to just sit here and talk to a guy who's making $25 an hour and he's telling you he's having a hard time to meeting, making ends meet. Well, that $25 an hour is $50,000 a year, but I'm paying $30,000 a year for your health insurance. And on top of that, I'm putting another $15,000 into your retirement account. Let me let me just give you another example of of what it costs to apparently costs to live around here, or or or, or to have an affordable. Uh, affordable. Uh, I shared this with Catalano a couple of weeks ago, but it didn't it didn't make air. I ran into a police officer at uh, Kingston City Hall. Young young, well, they're all young officers. Uh, this this guy was probably in his mid twenties, and we got talking about uh, uh, Chief Chief Tenty's uh, concerns about. Uh, he needs, I think, 10 or 12 new officers to replace the guys, who, the people who have retired, and to uh, add three more that the that the uh, council authorized in their uh, in uh, next year's budget. And uh, so I uh, took the sympathetic view that you know maybe it's just hard these days to to recruit police officers because they're under a lot of stress and uh, vilification and defund the police and uh, some of those things that are going on. And and the cops said to me, uh, "No, he said we can we can deal with that." Cops cops have always dealt with various aspects of that. He said, "It's uh, it's the uh, it's the wages." And I said, "Geez, fifty thousand bucks a year for a police officer? You know, some twenty one year old uh, yeah. person." And at age forty two, he will get a fifty percent retirement benefit and full health insurance benefits for the rest of his life. My point, Jim, is that this is a young police officer married with two children and 50,000 bucks a year he feels and I doubt if he's extravagant uh, $50,000 a year which I would have died for in my working time uh, is not adequate Tomorrow morning, I will go to town hall and propose we double the wages for everybody in our town employment base. And can anybody live in the town after we have to affect the tax increases? That is the position that the supervisor is in. I can't answer whether it's adequate or not. I can only answer that if I did that and had to pay for it, nobody so could live, could saying, pay to live. There's, there's a balance, balance between how much you can tax the people and how much you can pay the employees. That's correct. You know, and I hear people coming to the town board meeting saying, I'm tired of subsidizing these businesses. Does anybody understand that the businesses under the homestead, non-homestead taxing uh, policy of the Kingston Consolidated School District, every commercial property pays 125% tax as opposed to the residential, which is paying 100%.
So who's getting subsidized? Good question. <clears throat> We're supposed to be asking you questions, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. We don't have any answers. <laughs> uh, and my answers we only have questions here. My <laughs> answers are strictly limited to the town of Ulster and, and to what I can do to keep the services going. Okay, so very quickly, we got a few minutes left. Tell us about this, the uh, old Hudson Valley Mall. Anything happening there? The last time you were here, you told us there was possibly a high rise. There were going to be uh, some other uh, entities that were looking at it. Have you heard anything? that you can share some sort of uh, good cheer for the new year, you know, well, some, some hope that... Uh, you ask, you know, some people would ask, why is it that he uh, takes a position of no housing on Tech City? Because I have, the town of Ulster has two distressed properties. Each property has a unique set of alternative uses. We've already tried putting a, a distribution center up at the Hudson Valley Mall, but because of Target, and their ownership interest in the building and the land lease, and now with the medical center, you can't demolish the entire mall and put a, di a distribution center up there. That goes off. That's a, eliminated as an option for the, the hill. Okay. That can be done down, down below. Now, the guys down below want housing. The guys up on the hill want housing. There's not enough absorption, which means there's, there's not enough people that are going to take up. If they build 300 units of housing, between those two projects, somebody's going to get hurt. They're not going to be able to lease up fast enough, yeah. whatever. How can the town of Ulster government promote housing in both locations? We can't because we're eating each other. The, each project's yeah. eating each yeah. other. Yeah. Oh, sure. So right now, our best hope is, is that the owners of the mall continue to search out in the um, retail market alternative tenancies in, from retailers and they are there are some out there there are some looking and that's all I can say okay we're looking for some type of an announcement that will change the face of the mall at some point in the first quarter of 2023 I can tell you that I think they underestimate the uh, the buying power of the locals because we've gotten a big infusion of people. The people who are driving up the real estate prices also have a tremendous amount of flexible income. And they have not been accounted for because they're all recently moving into the area. Uh, but I think uh, re retail stores are doing better than the ones that we have are doing better. I mean, I couldn't get down on mm. Albany Avenue the other day. Uh, the car there were so many damn cars the anecdotal evidence is you go into Adams's parking lot at noontime you see all the uh, New York City New Jersey based car license plate holders yeah expensive cars you know because I talked to employees in Adams mm -hmm. they're getting slammed you look at some of the upscale retailers like Target probably mm -hmm. um, they'll go to Target before they go to Walmart Absolutely. they're doing fine Target's going to be doing a renovation of their store wow. um, so you look around, but the question I have to ask, because I was here in 2000, and, uh, the year 2000 when we looked at the outflows from 9-11. Mm -hmm. That lasted about a year to two years. Yeah. Everybody got tired of doing the commute. Now maybe this time's different because technology supports remote work better than it did 20 years ago. Oh, absolutely. We'll see. But if this, permanent, if this population move is permanent, Yes, we are going to have an increase, and this is this is demonstrated in the fact that the sales tax revenues in Ulster County are through the roof right now. Yeah, and they are through the roof in the town of Ulster. Yeah. Now, if the car dealers only had some inventory, they'd be further through the roof because, in the sales tax equation, sales of automobiles are the largest generator of sales tax in the county. We. We need uh, Jim, uh, is that sales tax agreement uh, up for a renewal anytime soon? It was uh, renewed in 2021, in the spring of 2020. Mm -hmm. No, the sp in, in 2020, I believe. That's like two years. Yes. Two years ago. And pretty much renewed, right? Correct. And in that agreement, the towns were successful in negotiating a greater allocation of sales tax based upon exceeding the 2020 mm -hmm. budgeted yeah. sales taxes. Yeah. I presume you had a hand in that. Both hands. 
<laughs> one pick in the pocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both yeah, hands. you know, uh, you're right. Um, there, there's a, the tremendous demand for automobiles. I, 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 I just see it everywhere, uh, and uh, people are very frustrated that uh, they can't find. You know, it's, it, it's crazy. Online sales are great, except when you have to try something on and it doesn't fit. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a major magilla to get the damn thing back to the company, et cetera, et cetera. My opinion is people like to try on clothing, and, and we should have more clothing stores. Well, after I came back from my trip last week, my wife said, you need three pairs of new shorts. And by the way, here's the package from the mail order company. Go try them on. I'll return the ones you don't like. Yeah, I know. But it's it's a nuisance. The boxers or briefs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, listen. We want to thank you. Yes, thanks, Jim. Always good always, to have you on. You're always um, loaded with uh, knowledge, and I think the listeners appreciate it. We answered the question of the individual that called about uh, we weren't able to get to the nitty-gritty on the BOCES, but we did find out that they're at the table weighing their options. Um, and we resolved the issue of the IBM uh, rec center, which uh, was another issue. Uh, and uh, listen, you're in a really dynamic situation out there because I think uh, it's going to be there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, going on. So anyway, thank you. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to everyone. Happy New Year to everybody. Yes, Merry Christmas to all and you guys. Happy New everyone. Year. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We'll be back on Monday with Medical Monday.